and okay um yeah so good evening everybody and thanks for joining us tonight for the first views and brews of 2022 i'm jared stewart the strategic communications manager with the mount st helens institute and i'll be your host tonight uh, the Mount St. Helens Institute is the official nonprofit partner of uh, Mount St. Helens National Vol Vol Volcanic Monument. We work to advance understanding of the earth through science, education, and exploration of volcanic landscapes. Um, we're still doing views and brews online, but in-person programming is coming back. Our education teams are currently accepting GeoGirls applications. Uh, for those of you that don't know, that's a five-night science camp for girls um it's free thanks to grants and generous donors and any girl who wants to attend will have to apply on our website by april 10th um if you want to get out and explore uh, we have some high adventure and uh, you get to learn about mount st helens join us on a summer guided program there's no better way than through one of our guided adventures you can summit the volcano and get up close and personal with crater glacier on the glacier overlook hike and uh you know these trips not only get you to some amazing places, but our expert staff can provide, you know, rich ecological, geological, and cultural context for what you're seeing and experiencing. It adds so much depth to the landscape. Um, and if you enjoy yourself this evening and find that the kind of work we do resonates with you, please consider making a donation by visiting our website. We'll be posting a link to do that um, in the chat, as well as some other links and resources about our speaker. So um, I'd also like to note that the Mount St. Helens Institute is a proud partner of the Kalich tribe. And we encourage you wherever you are to learn about the indigenous cultures where you live. Um, we work on the land of the Kalich and the confederated bands and tribes of the Yakima nation. The legacy of an ancient people in Southwest Washington is rich with descendants who occupied a vast territory in this region prior to European exploration and confiscation of these lands. And they continue to thrive today. Please keep this in mind as you come to Mount St. Helens and experience the landscape. So let's get to tonight's events. If you have questions while you're watching, please feel free to ask them in the chat feed and we'll get to as many as we can. Our presenter tonight is Julie Beeler. Julie conceived and launched the Mushroom Color Atlas to grow her work in passion and to benefit what she values most, curiosity, education, creativity, collaboration, community, and the environment. Her background in interactive design, along with her years of teaching, has informed her approach to publishing the Mushroom Color Atlas as an online educational experience for people around the world to access. When she is not foraging, you can find her tending to her flower farm, Bloom and Die, working in her art studio, or leading workshops. I give you Julie Beeler. Well, thank you, Jared. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm so excited you're here. I see family and friends in the audience. This is very exciting. Um, I am going to take a moment here and just go share my screen. So bear with me while I get that all set up. And hopefully everything works and it advances. Jared is going to interrupt me if you can't see my screen. Um, but yes, thanks uh, Mount St. Helens Institute for the invitation to present tonight and Jared for making it all happen and for you guys joining. Um, I thought as we started the evening, I wanted to start us off with a quote from Ursula Le Guin. For those of us in the Pacific Northwest, we're lucky to have had Ursula in our community in Portland. And she has this quote that really resonates with me, to use the world well, to be able to stop wasting it and our time in it, we need to relearn our being in it. And that resonates with me in, at many levels, but one is just as we're connecting with nature and we're experiencing our habitat and we're thinking about our impact on that and uh, informing us how we can become better stewards of our local environment and ultimately of our planet as we face you know various crises environmental and so forth that are out there so i thought i would start us off with that um it's just something to think about while we're talking about the mushroom color atlas and now i'm going to take us back in time 
Uh, for those of you that are from the area, you know exactly what this is. This is the eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980. Uh, this is one of my very first photos that I took. And uh, my mom found these photos and I remember taking them and she found them and showed me them a couple months ago. And I was like, I can't believe this. Um, they took me to get a little Kodak pocket Instamatic camera. I was nine years old and you know, it was just amazing. And, and I remember my dad running into the house and saying, girl, she blew, she blew. And it was like, what? And we ran out to the driveway and I snap these pictures. And of course I look at them now and I'm like, well, I didn't have the foresight to get in front of the power lines. So we have power lines going <laughs> through, but anyways, the purpose for showing this is that this mountain has a uh, real incredible meaning to me. It's the first mountain I got to know. Um, the indigenous peoples referred to this mountain as Lewitt, which means smoking mountain. And here I am uh, with my sister in the driveway of a cabin that my parents had as an A-frame kind of cabin off the grid up at the mountain. Um, I started going to this cabin when I was two and a half years old in 1973. Here we are, sorry, dad got your photo in here, but here we are at the Swift Reservoir uh, playing, and this is a view of what it looked like then. And here I am catching my very first fish at five years old along the muddy river, um, and then out playing in the snow. My mom, we had these little saucers, and my mom reminded me this is when we got the car stuck in the tree well, uh, so we spent a little time here, so maybe she was entertaining us. Um, and so that was my journey uh, as a young kid from 73 to 1980. And then, you know, that moment when the mountain blew, it was pretty uh, powerful. It was unimaginable, it was uncomprehendable. And it was also kind of heartbreaking because this place that we knew and had been going to didn't exist. And we didn't really have any sense of what it was. So I didn't spend a lot of time uh, growing up going back to the mountain. I went a couple of times in college and as a young adult, but I got an invitation from the Mount St. Helens Institute in 2009 um, to hike into the crater. And it was the first time that scientists and geologists and uh, people at the Forest Service had been to the mountain. And I think it was about eight years because she had been active during this time period and no one was going into the crater. And it was just, it was, as awe-inspiring and mind-blowing and unimaginable as that eruption was to walk in this landscape. Um, and here I am going up. This is a different climb where I summited the mountain from the south side, some views looking out uh, Spirit Lake back there, and then at the summit looking down into the crater. And then here I am in 2019. Uh, so over the past you know, 10, 12 years, I've spent a lot of time on the mountain. I'm at Spirit Lake here. And then this is another hike into the crater in 2019 with the current uh, director of the Mount St. Helens Institute, Ray Yurkovitz. Uh, we went there, this is looking up into the crater, you know, this active, you know, volcanic landscape as this mountain rebuilds herself. Um, so that's a little bit of my history with the mountain and my love affair with it. Um, I'm showing this because in the upper corner, you'll see an interactive screen that's returned to life. I had a career in interactive media. My husband and I had an interactive studio in Portland, and we did the interactive installations for the Mount St. Helens Institute that are up at Johnston Ridge and some of the other facilities where you can look at the return to life over those 35 years. Um, I also did other work, um, some collections work for museums and cultural institutions. Um, our studio was dedicated to entertaining, educating and inspiring through storytelling, innovation and Digital media was our world. And I show this because you're gonna learn that I took some of my love and passion of my career in interactive media and brought that to life to help realize the Mushroom Color Atlas. Um, so mushrooms, this is my quick little journey with mushrooms. I was always fascinated with them, you know, as a kid, finding them up at Mount St. Helens, 
fruiting and all these unique shapes and colors and not even really knowing what they were at all, uh, you know, thinking there's some kind of plant or something. But I was always fascinated with them. I spent a lot of time hiking, photographing. And it wasn't until a hike that I took with my husband in the Tetons. And we were there in mid-September and the mushrooms were going crazy. And we were walking down this path and, you know, all different kinds of species and varieties and colors and shapes. And I felt like I was being led down the yellow brick road. And I just said to myself, this whole time I've wanted to learn more about the fungi kingdom and I'm going to do it. The minute we get home, I'm going to sign up for the Oregon Mycological Society. So I did. This is a photograph of me on that hike. I started bringing mushrooms back into my studio. It started organizing them, starting to learn to identify them. I took um, lots of identification courses and working with them. And that coincided with um, this journey with my textile work. I uh, grew up lucky enough to have a grandmother who had a fabric and yarn shop. And so we did all kinds of crafts. So not only did I have parents who were getting me into the outdoors and exploring the natural world, I had a grandmother and we were always making and creating things. And so I was bringing these worlds together and I thought I really want to kind of elevate my textile and quilting and start making my own fabric. So the minute after I joined um, the Oregon Mycological Society, I typed into Google because I thought, I wonder if mushrooms make color. And sure enough, they do. And I'll tell that story in a second, but that led me down this path of uh, working with various natural dyes, but specifically with natural dyes. Um, I was teaching at the Oregon College of Art and Craft, as well as the Pacific Northwest College of Art. And my mentor there, Judah Lee Fitzhugh, and she was a mentor in natural dyes and headed up the fibers department. She started up a study group. We met every week and I was then, you know, experimenting and learning all about mushroom dyes and bringing that to the study group. And that's kind of how those two worlds came together for me. And that takes me to where I live today. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to live in Trout Lake, Washington, and the land where I live and the place where I call home uh, resides on the lands of the Yakima Nation, whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. Um, I have Gifford Pinchot uh, National Forest in my backyard, which happens to be the exact same national forest for Mount St. Helens. It's a large forest that connects um, the two mountains and the forests in between, and I have a amazing opportunity to get to forage uh, just right out my back door. Uh, as Jared mentioned, I have a flower farm, Bloom and Die, along the White Salmon River here in Trout Lake. And I grow uh, specialty cut flowers for a bouquet subscription that I deliver throughout the year. But I also grow a lot of natural dye plants. I harvest them, I dry them, I package and I sell them. And these uh, plants and flowers are used um, to make color and to make pigment and to make prints. And I also teach workshops at my studio as well as other locations. And all of this that I grow, I create uh, and make my own textile pieces. So this is an example of indigo and marigold grown here and over dyed to create this variety of colors. And all the pieces behind me on the wall, those are all dyed with mushrooms. Um, so you can get a whole array of colors from here. Um, I did want to talk about another uh, quote as we start to talk more about mushrooms and get into this. Um, for those of you that haven't had an opportunity to read Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, I highly encourage it. Uh, he's a phenomenal scientist, but also his writing is just uh, beautiful. Um, the metaphors and the, it's just incredible. So I highly recommend Merlin's book. And I bring this up because a lot of times when we're out in our forest environment, we're not really thinking about what's underground, like what is in the soil and what is happening there. And Merlin points out that 90% of all plant species depend on mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi are a specific type of fungi that have a uh, symbiotic relationship with the plants and the trees that are out in that 
environment. And he says they're the rule, not the exception. They're actually a more fundamental part of planthood than the fruit, the leaves, the flowers, the bark, the berries, and even the roots. Um, and he also continues on and he talks about this partnership between the fungi and the plants. And he says, you know, it's complete with cooperation and conflict and competition, but the plants and the mycorrhizal fungi enact this collective flourishing. And I love this. He says, it underpins our past, our present and our future. I mean, it really is, you know, the reason for the existence of the plants and the trees on our planet. And he says, we are unthinking, without them, yet seldom do we think about them. And he said, that's an attitude that we can no longer afford to sustain. Um, so as we're going through the, these environments and habitats, it can just be your yard. It could be a park, you know, in an urban setting, the significance of the mycelium of the fungi kingdom. Not all fungi are mycorrhizal, some are, all, um, different types of fungi. Some are there and they rot out trees. Um, and some people think, oh, that's really bad. And it's like, no, actually that tree was maybe having a problem. So here the um, fungi is there to decompose it and return it to the soil. So there is a long historical use of fungi for dyeing um, that we know about thanks to Dominique Cardone's work um, published in her book, Natural Science we can actually date this use of fungi for dyeing back to the 15th century. Uh, this mushroom, Larsifomus officinalis, which is known as a garricon, was used as an element to get these crimson colors from an insect dye that they were using called kermes. And it was referenced as popo or opopo. And that references agarico, which is agaric, and here we've got the agaricon. And for those of you that know about uh, mushroom species, the agaric mushroom is a, a large species. Um, there's reference to the use of this mushroom in the Goblin's Dye Works in Paris in the 1660s and in Dutch manuscripts in the 1630s. Um, these types of mushrooms you see on screen are, are called a polypore. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. But, you know, polypores weren't just used in Europe. There's actually a long tradition of them being used in North Africa, Central Asia, and actually here in Northwest North America. Um, these polypores can give varying shades of, you know, yellows or reds or violets, depending on um, the species. So we've got another polypore here, um, Fomus fomentarius. This is the tinder fungus or the hoof fungus or amadou. Those are all common names for this mushroom of which there are a lot. Um, but what's interesting about mushrooms for those of you here uh, tonight that know a little bit about natural dyeing, um, to affix a color to a fiber, we have to go through a process called mordanting. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit at the end, but the mordant is um, a natural mineral that is occurring that binds with the color to make the color uh, light fast or color fast to actually stick. And here we have in the tinder fungus, it's a natural occurring uh, accumulator, sorry, of a mordant called alum. So not only does it have dye properties, it has mordanting properties. And the inner uh, area of this mushroom is called amadou. It's this real velvety soft inner uh, essence that often was pounded into a felt-like material to make hats in Transylvania. Um, and that amadou was actually used um, to help heal wounds and stop bleeding. It was used um, for wicks to make tinder boxes. And for those of you that know Otzi, the Iceman that was discovered back in the 90s, they found his um, little pouch had Fomus fomentarius in it as a way to light fires. Um, I'll advance here to the next screen. So this mulberry polypore um, until recently has a history of being used in the Taklamon Desert. Um, for dyes, and it's no coincidence, but kind of the 
oasis is along the silk route where this mushroom would fruit, they were combined there. Not only was that mushroom um, exchanged in the, on the Silk Road, but the transfer of knowledge and this information was shared about using mushrooms um, for dyeing. And then we finally get to uh, one of my favorite mushrooms, Aconodontium tinctorium. Uh, this is the Indian paint fungus mushroom. I affectionately call it E.T. because I grew up in the era of the E.T. movie, but it's also just easier to say E.T. than it is to say Aconodontium tinctorium. But um, this mushroom is the source of the bright red body paint um, that you would see indigenous peoples use. It was not only for aesthetic and symbolic purposes, but it actually had uh, different properties. It was used to help protect the skin from a sunburn. Uh oh, I see my little thing going out over there. I don't know what happened. Anyways, um, my overhead camera went off. So I'll get to the bottom of that in a second. But anyways, it was used to protect the skin from sunburn. It was also used um, as a repellent to keep mosquitoes away and often was used to help reduce um, sun glare for um, snow blindness. So, and when we use this today, it can produce a variety of purplish, pinkish, orangish colors um, that you can get. And uh, let's see, we'll advance. Oops, now oh, everything's going, there we go. Okay, so I mentioned when I put in that uh, Google search query, if mushrooms make color, I came across uh, Miriam Rice. And Miriam Rice uh, in 1968, she was an educator teaching young kids about natural dyes at the Mendocino Arts Center. And she was invited on a foray with some friends and it piqued her interest. So she thought, I'll, I'll go look for some mushrooms. And famously, she scooped up some sulfur tufts and she steeped them in some warm water. And voila, she got this beautiful lemony yellow color and uh, it produced dye. And Miriam was fascinated and intrigued, and she continued down this path in the 70s, doing all kinds of experimentation and documentation. She published this book, Mushrooms for Color, which is out of print and very hard to come by. But what I came across was um, Mushrooms for Dyes, Paper, Pigments, and Microsticks. It had recently been republished by Paul Stamets of Fungi Perfecti, and I bought this book and I went crazy. I was cooking up mushrooms in my kitchen, making my house stink. It was so much fun. I had a great time, although I don't know how much my husband loved it. Um, and then a few years later, I came across this additional fantastic resource for mushroom dye, the rainbow beneath my feet. It's a foraging um, field guide from Arlene and Alan Bassetti. And uh, the title alone just makes me smile. You know, every time you're out walking and just think about that mushroom beneath your feet, that rainbow of colors that we can get from mushroom dyes. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and show the mushroom color atlas. Um, I'm gonna pull it up here, sorry. I've got to, where am I? Zoom, share screen, there you are. So hopefully you can all see the Mushroom Color Atlas. So you can get to the Mushroom Color Atlas, just simply mushroomcoloratlas.com. And uh, I put this together as uh, a reference and a resource online to kind of document uh, all the tests with, that I've done with mushrooms, but to create this resource for people to be able to learn. Um, a lot of people, when they think about mushrooms, they're thinking about them for edibility, because of course mushrooms are delicious to eat for medicinal purposes, because they have wonderful uh, healing properties and so forth. And I thought if we can find a way for people to get excited and think about mushrooms from the perspective of color or art or design and inform them that way. So you can scroll through the mushroom color atlas here by color and you can see it'll highlight the mushroom that is available. Um, so I'm scrolling through here. I'm gonna get down to the bottom and click one of my uh, favorite mushrooms over here. Oops, where are you? Well, I've lost you, are you there? Anyways, I can't find it, but my, my favorite mushroom. You've disappeared on me. 
Here's one of my favorites. So this is a blue chanterelle. When you click and go down in, you can see all the color swatches. So these are all on fabric, different types of fabric with different mordens. And this is all pigment that you can make paint with. And this is looking at watercolor paint. You can click and zoom in and uh, see the color swatches in greater detail. Um, you can also click on the illustrations and see those high resolution. You can get the information about how to dye with them. Um, and now we'll go to another mushroom. Um, I'm showing the Cortinarius neosanguinis. It's one of my favorites uh, because it creates red. It's just a beautiful mushroom. But in this case, look at the diversity of colors that you can get from one mushroom. So, you know, unlocking and kind of revealing the tinctoria of these mushrooms is just super, super exciting. Um, I have a process section that walks you through all the details of um, how I went about creating the mushroom color atlas and everything you can do at home um, to start dying with mushrooms. And it also has an index where it organizes the mushroom by type. And for those of you that are beginners at uh, learning to identify mushrooms, organizing them by type is a very, very helpful way. And uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and go back to sharing my keynote. Sorry, have to get that Zoom green button here. So hopefully you guys all see this. Um, so that's just a quick demo of the Mushroom Color Atlas. I really encourage you guys, if you're interested and curious, you can go spend more time. Um, now that you have seen that, I thought I'd show you a little of the behind the scenes. Um, I was working on this and kind of conceiving of the different ideas of how to realize this atlas. And I was doing these black and white line drawings that we call um, experience it's experience design and they're basically showing how this whole site would come together. And while I was doing that, my husband was very um, interested in designing it. Uh, Brad started to think about, well, what does the typography look like and how do the colors inform the layout? So while I was working on the overall experience design, he was working on the visual design and it was starting uh, to come together. We spent a lot of time talking about the mushrooms themselves and how they should be represented on the site. We spent time like, should they be photographs? Should they be illustrations? Should they be colored black and white? And we landed on black and white illustrations. And I thought, okay, so I went out to Instagram and I started looking up uh, different artists and illustrators. And I came across Yuli Gates, uh, this piece of hers on the left side, which are, um, illustrations of edible mushrooms for those of you that might recognize them and I thought this is perfect and amazing and so I connected with Yuli she was in the UK um, she was in the healthcare industry and so when I started this project it was um, in February or March of 2021 and so she had been kind of through the thick of COVID and she said I can't think of anything better on my stretches of time off than to draw these mushrooms. And here you can see some of her uh, dye mushrooms. So she really enjoyed it because she'd work these really long, intense stretches, and then she'd come back and illustrate these beautiful dye mushrooms. So when we think about mushrooms, um, for those of us that you know have just been out in the forest maybe looking or have seen them in books or illustrations or posters or what have you, this drawing here um, on the left uh, from my friend, Rachel Zoller, this is kind of what we think of as a classic mushroom, right? It's got this cap, it's got gills underneath, it's got this stipe or stem or stalk, whatever you wanna call it. It's coming up out of this kind of sack that is down in the soil and it is always connected with mycelium. Mycelium are the roots of the fungus. And, you know, not all mushrooms, look exactly like this one, right? Because look at all these dye mushrooms here um, that Yuli illustrated. There's only a few that really look like your quintessential mushroom. So as you're out there starting to learn about mushrooms, you can start to organize them uh, by type and uh, think about, well, what family is that? And what species does that belong? What type of mushroom? And that helps narrow it down. Um, my friend Michael Bug, who lives in my community up here, he lives in Houston, Washington, 
And he is a world-renowned mycologist. He happens to be Paul Stamets professor at Evergreen. Um, and he is just the most delightful, wonderful individual. He just published a new book about six months ago called Mushrooms of Cascadia. So if anyone is interested in learning more about the mushrooms in this area and how to identify them, I highly recommend Michael's book. He did a fantastic job of organizing it kind of according to this type rather than these complicated, um, what we call keys in the mycological world. It's a great way for beginners um, to get immersed in mushrooms. And he's got over a thousand species that are here in the Pacific Northwest. So I highly recommend that book. So I'm gonna take a moment and um, walk you through some different mushrooms based on the type. So when we think about uh, the fungi kingdom, it breaks down into species and the species have varieties and sub varieties and so forth. But if we start to think, okay, there is a type of mushroom that represents a species. For example, Belitz. Many people know the Belitz family because here I'm holding the very famous, uh, you know, Belitz rex versus this is the spring king belit or there's belitus edulis which is the fall king belit but those are known as the porcini they're delectable edible they are one of my favorite but look at what else they do they make color and often people will be like oh my gosh you're using all these great edible mushrooms to make color and that's a waste and i'm always like no i'm not because this picture illustrates it really well. This is a huge whopper of a porcini. And the big, huge one, you really probably don't want to eat that because most likely it's filled with maggots. But that little button over there, that little piggy, uh, is a perfect size for edibility. It hasn't grown. It hasn't matured. And there isn't much color in that little one. You can see this is a close-up detail of that cap. And you can see here, um, beliefs have these, these pores and they're colored. That is where the color comes from. It doesn't come from the stem at all. It just comes from these caps. And by the time these mushrooms are big and have color, you probably don't want to eat them. Um, I don't know. You could get lucky and find one that doesn't have any anything living in it. But um, another favorite type of um, fungi out there is the coral fungi family. And this literally looks like a coral you would find at the bottom of an ocean. It is just gorgeous. And it's one of my favorites. They come in all different size, shapes, colors. It's a, a family that has a lot of different um, varieties. It's often very hard to identify and distinguish which variety without looking through a microscope. Um, but what I know is here is a dye study with this mushroom. Now, if you like beige and yellow, it's gonna make those colors for you. But if you look at the mushroom color atlas and you learn if you put a little iron in it, you get these beautiful purpley grays that are just gorgeous. Um, you want to find Romeria that tends to have more color. It's not the light cream ones, but they're the ones that are more orange and bright, like I showed. And uh, yeah, I, it's this magic mushroom. You can, you can put non uh, mordanted fiber in, like no iron, steep it in it, and then put it in an iron after bath, and voila, the color shows up. It's kind of like those. Uh, magic markers when you were a kid and you'd write something you couldn't see it but as soon as you put something over the top it would reveal the message i've already shown you this this is one of my favorite um this is a blue chanterelle in the polyozelis family and it is a type of mushroom that is a false gill mushroom and what that means is you can see the gills run all the way down the the stem or the stalk of this mushroom and there is a very famous edible false gilled mushroom that a lot of you have probably eaten. It's the chanterelle, the yellow chanterelle. Um, but here we have um, the blue chanterelle, which is edible. Uh, it isn't exactly one of my favorite because it's a little more woody. And when you look at the colors it creates in the dye pot, I just can't bring myself to eat it. Plus, it, it's just gorgeous. I mean, it really is 
the flower of the forest floor. I can and do spend hours just in awe of it, taking its photograph and the delicate beauty of it. It's just one of my favorites. So another type of mushroom is the false guild types. And then that gets us to the guild mushroom. This looks like your kind of classic mushroom. Uh, this is a cortinarius mushroom. Um, cortinarius is a huge species of mushrooms, so big that it has uh, subspecies. And the subspecies that tends to give the most color is in the Dermostibi family. And this is the um, Cortinarius neosanguinus. It's called the rest, Western Blood Red Court. And it has that name for a reason. Not only does it look red, I mean, look at all that red in the cap there, but it creates beautiful reds. And what's interesting about this mushroom is some people that are very particular and want to get these amazing reds, they will separate the caps from the stems. They will pull every one of them apart and they will do a dye bath with just the caps to get a true red because the stems have a little more orange in them. So here we have mushrooms that have multiple uh, chemical compounds in them. They're making multiple sets of colors. And that's why I showed that as that one example that you can coax different colors from the same type of mushroom, depending on what you do. Um, these little guys can be very tiny. Um, so it can often take a while to find enough to do, you know, to dye some fiber and so forth, but they're just wonderful. And then we get into another type of mushroom that's called the polypore. And um, polypores are prevalent in our forests uh, growing. I showed some polypores that are connected historically to dyes, but you'll see them, you know, sometimes as shelf fungus growing up the side of a tree. Uh, this is the famed dyer's polypore, uh, Faola schwetzenitzi. Um, this is actually um, a butt rot or a white rot. Uh, so when you see this with trees, it is going through the process of decomposing that tree. So you can often find these in like urban settings or campgrounds where people have like cut down a healthy tree. Um, the fungi are then coming in and saying, okay, we've got to start to decompose that and uh, take it back into soil. But this mushroom is amazing. It produces four different colors. I'm not even showing the fourth colorway, but you can get the yellows, the oranges, the greens, and browns. Um, it's got so many colorful pigments in them. And this is a great specimen. It's got some yellowish white around the edge. And uh, here's the detail of it. You can kind of see those pores in there um, that are just great to work with. And I'm showing this picture because this is what the mushroom looks like at a very young stage. It looks very different than that little more middle-aged mushroom I showed. And that's something to keep in mind. Mushrooms can look very different through different points of their life. Kind of like us humans. We look a little different younger versus middle-aged versus older. Um, now, when I spot a mushroom that is young like this, I'm not gonna wanna harvest it for dying uh, because I want it to mature. I want it to get more color. I want it to get older um, and I'm gonna leave it, but I'm gonna mark it and I'm gonna check back on it every couple of weeks and see how it's doing and then harvest it at that right time. And I'm gonna talk about harvesting and kind of all the ethics around that in a little bit. Um, this is another type of mushroom that I'm sure you guys have all seen. It's the puffball family. You can get these big, huge puffballs. You'll find them in fields or wherever, and you can kind of step on them and all the spores puff up. Well, this is um, the dyer's puffball, uh, the pisolithus, and you can just see the color in this mushroom. I mean, look at the yellows, the oranges, the greens, the browns, and it just produces glorious, like goldeny brown colors that I don't know only this mushroom does it that's something magical about them and I'm not a huge fan of brown but I love the color from this mushroom and then we get to my favorite family of um, type of mushroom it's the tooth fungi uh, they're my favorite for a few reasons they're fascinating and curious I mean look at this mushroom this is hydnellum sorellium it's the blue orange hydnellum but look at the colors I mean 
you get blues. Blues are very hard to come by um, in the natural dye world. Indigo is a very famous blue and woad. But here we've got a whole family of mushrooms with tons of species, uh, tons of varieties that create these colors. And they just sparkle. And you see them on the forest floor and they're just glistening and glowing. And in fact, if you look closely at this mushroom, you see some little red droplets around it. And that is actually gutation. And gutation is mushroom sweat. Mushroom sweat, just like us humans. When you think about what they're doing, what the mycelium and the fungi are doing and the relationship with the trees and the plants, they might be filtering out toxins from those trees. They're passing minerals, uh, water, sugars, what have you. And the, and the fruit is uh, the mushroom. So when that mushroom's fruiting, it may have some of those toxins in it. and it may have different things and they're sweating them out or they're storing them. That's why many mushrooms, you know, are, some are poisonous, many make you not feel too good if you eat them, so you shouldn't eat them. Um, but that is, is why they are having this relationship. They're doing a lot of work. And the other thing to think about with a mushroom is the mushroom truly is the fruit, right? So when you go pick an apple tree, you're picking all the apples off the apple tree as your fruit. You're never cutting down a limb to get an apple. You're never chopping down the tree to get the apples. And so the mycelium is actually, you know, the equivalent of that apple tree. And that's what we want to be really considerate about when we're in the forest, where we're not disturbing that habitat and we're truly just plucking that fruit, that beautiful mushroom. So I am going to switch to my overhead camera. I'm going to stop sharing this. I have a slight problem. I don't know what happened here. I'm going to see oh no i can't read it what does it say it's got some message for me sorry everyone hopefully you're not seeing me try to read this thing i i don't know what i had i need better eyesight oh that just kicked me out okay hold on sorry there's always got to be a technical glitch because, you know, why not? Um, let me go back over here. I'm going to get my phone back on. Sorry, Jared, you are going to have to connect me again. I don't know why it kicked me out, but it did. Okay. Here I am. Okay, it's being recorded, got it. Now you're seeing me. Okay, we're all gonna go into the upside down world for a minute, get snapped in here to my tripod. Okay. Oh, oh no, I just turned the video off. Hmm. Hold on. Sorry, everyone. Okay, the video is on. Let's make sure it stays on because I wanna walk you through these amazing mushrooms. Okay, hopefully everyone's seen. Jared, you'd let me know if they're not, I hope. Um, so what I have here are a bunch of mushrooms and the colors that they produce. And we just talked about the different types of mushrooms and I wanted to show you guys some of these. So this is a tooth fungus. This is Hidnellum regium. And this is a mushroom that wasn't supposed to grow in our area. And you can see it's kind of this strange looking mushroom. And it was a lot bigger. This is a dried specimen. It was a lot bigger when I uh, collected it, but the colors that it creates, these beautiful dark greens and blues are just amazing on all these different fabrics. Um, the fabrics are wool, silk, and linen. 
And it can create a whole variety of paints and pigments that you can use um, for any kind of uh, art project and so forth. And here is another mushroom in that same family of tooth fungi. This is um, the Hedonellum suaviolens. Look how different those look from, um, let's see, move it over there more, from what you just saw. And here you can see they're growing in clusters. So they've got a couple of little babies. And again, this was much larger when I harvested it. Um, I don't know if you can see the little teeth under there, but those are the teeth. That's why they're called tooth fungi. Uh, it was much larger when I harvested. These are all dried. And I think about 80 or 90% of a mushroom is actually water. So when they dry, they shrink tremendously. But look at these beautiful blues that you can get. And again, the pigments, these nice green blues and even getting some browns in there. This is a mushroom I did not show um, in my presentation. This is the lobster mushroom. And uh, over there at Mount St. Helens, there are a lot of these mushrooms. And in fact, all the mushrooms that I'm showing are over in the um, habitats and environments surrounding Mount St. Helens. And the lobster mushroom, some of you have probably heard of it. It's an edible mushroom. Um, it's a unique mushroom in that it's a, it's a just a regular white rustle of mushroom, but then it is parasitized by a fungi and that transforms it into an edible mushroom, but it also is what makes it viable. And so again, another mushroom where people think, oh, you're wasting all these lobsters, you should be eating them. And I'm always like, well, I want my lobsters old and slimy and gross and no one's gonna wanna eat them. But here are these just gorgeous colors that you can get from this mushroom. Here is the uh, famed Dyer's polypore that has a few little pieces on it. But you can see this was a, a larger specimen here. You can see the color underneath there. And you can also see those pores on the surface. So they're not gills like we think about with that traditional mushroom. Um, and this is harvested at a great stage where it still has that yellowish orange color. Um, you can harvest them a little later in life as well, but that's a great time to get them. And here that range of greens, yellows, oranges, browns, and then the pigment. You can really shift the colors on the pigment, which is just so nice. They're just beautiful. Um, now I'm going to show you E.T. So this is a Conodontium tinctorium, and I love the specimen. And what's interesting is this mushroom looks very different than this mushroom, right? But they are in the exact same uh, family. They're tooth fungi. You can see the teeth on this. This is a mushroom that would have been attached to the side of a tree, high up in the tree. And for those of you that don't know, this is my favorite because this white webbing moving up through there, that is the mycelium. And here it is in the specimen and it's just spectacular. So anytime you've looked in the soil or moved some around and you see this kind of white um, thread web-like stuff, that is mycelium. That is that ever important roots of the mushrooms. And look at, you know, the colors for the dye, they're fine, they're nice, but look at what happens when it's transformed into a pigment. And this is why it's known, you know, uh, not only because of its medicinal properties, but it's aesthetically a very pleasing color. So it was used often. Here's another tooth fungi. In fact, this is the exact same mushroom I showed you the picture. You can see the little holes there. That was where the putation was, those little red droplets. Um, this is, uh, oh my gosh, I just spaced, Tidnellum sorellium. Sorry, that's a gnome suaviolum. How could I forget my mushrooms? But look at that. You can see the blue in there. It's just a gorgeous specimen. And then these colors. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. They just make me so happy. And then the pigments, getting these greens and then shifting them into these browns and yellows. Just that range and diversity. This is a piece of the Dyer's puffball that I showed you guys. 
this is just a chunk of it. Um, this literally, if I crushed it, would turn into dust. Um, it, the spores are very, very fine. But here are those goldeny browns that are amazing. And this mushroom uh, makes beautiful ink. It is just a gorgeous ink. And for those that know, uh, ink is a little different than making a pigment or uh, watercolor, just like some nuances there, but the ink is just, oh, I love it. And here we have some of our Cortinaria. So I wanted to show these to give you a sense of size and scale in my hand. They can be teeny, teeny, tiny. And these are in the guild family. They've got the gills, just like we thought. You can see the color in this mushroom, the red, and creating these amazing, you know, these dark reds and purples across all the uh, fiber types. So beautiful. And then the pigments themselves, it's like, oh my gosh, look at that. Just, just gorgeous. Um, now we have a Cortinarius, and then I'm sorry, this guy has broke. This is a Cortinarius that my mom and I find tons of along the Pacific coast. And uh, we've foraged pounds of these things. This is, um, creates orange. And I spaced its name. What's happening to me? I guess it's too late. And I'm not drinking, even though it is views and brews. Um, but I will think it'll come to me. Uh, but it creates oranges. So again, the same family, a dye mushroom, com creating completely different color palettes. So within one species, collecting these. But look how fascinating and curious that is. When we turn it to pigment, you're getting reds. But you're not getting that in the dye. So it's just a really interesting, beautiful mushroom. So that's a little tour of the mushrooms and their colors kind of according to the types. And now we can unspotlight me and I will go back and we will talk about dying with mushrooms. So I love this quote from Jonathan Rieke. He's the director of the Somerset House in the UK. And he talks about that mushrooms may be rooted in history, but our interaction with them is all about like channeling human creativity in new and unexpected ways. And I came across this quote after I created the Mushroom Color Atlas. And I was like, that's it. Like, this is my hope and dream for this Mushroom Color Atlas as a resource to get people immersed into the mycological world. And through that, start to begin to learn and understand more about our natural environment and become better stewards of our um, habitats. So. I'm going to spend some time now talking about a little bit about the process. Um, the first thing is finding the mushrooms. And there are a lot of different uh, approaches and thoughts and philosophies on foraging mushrooms. And I'm going to share with you my approach. Uh, it's my approach. It is, you know, there's no right way or wrong way. Well, there are a few wrong things you can do, but you need to kind of adopt a foraging uh, philosophy that works well for you. Um, it's super important from the get-go that you have the right kind of permits. If you are harvesting in our local area in uh, Gifford Pinchot, you need to have a permit that you can get online at the Forest Service. It's free as long as you are not making these uh, mushrooms commercially for sale. It has limits on it of how much you can bring out of the forest, how many times you can go, et cetera. You need to make sure that you are not trespassing on private land and you need to make sure that you are not foraging from areas that are, you know, conservations or preservations or where it's not allowed. So you really do need to be ethical in how you go about foraging. And I am, a big believer of leaving some mushrooms behind. Um, I just adopt that philosophy because I feel that's giving back. All of these mushrooms, um, although they're the fruit and we know that the, the mycelium is there in the soil, so we know that it's gonna come back, but these mushrooms have ways to distribute spores. And if we're able to leave some behind and let them distribute their spores, similar to like if we're collecting wildflowers, if we can let them go to seed, 
and seed for more wildflowers in the future. I, I adopt that uh, philosophy. Um, now, there are people and you can take every mushroom if you want. You absolutely can the same way you can pick every apple off a tree. But what you cannot do is destroy that habitat or that environment where it's growing. The same way you're not going to go chop down an apple tree to get some apples. So if you want to do that, make sure not to disturb that habitat. And that gets into thinking about how you are going to pluck that little mushroom from the forest floor. Some of these tiny little ones I've shown you, the Cortinarius, I can just pull them out because they are really have very little impact on that little local environment. The soil is not getting disturbed, it's fine. But some of these bigger ones I showed you, like the Hidnellum regium or the Dyer's polypore, those are mushrooms that I elect to cut. And I elect to do that because if I'm gonna pull it up, it, it ends up pulling up a huge clump of soil, dirt, mycelium, I've disturbed that habitat. So I cut those out. There's a lot of debate in the mycological world is cutting, Cutting versus plucking, what is better? All these studies have been done and they can't really show that one is worse than the other, but I just think about it as what, what's my impact to that habitat? And if cutting it creates less of an impact, that's what I'm gonna do. If plucking it is fine and not gonna have an impact, then I do it. Um, so that's how you think about foraging. Now, when you're out foraging for mushrooms, do not eat a mushroom that you don't know what it is. You don't go around trying to figure out what mushroom it is by eating it. There are poisonous mushrooms. There are mushrooms that will kill you. Um, there happen to be more mushrooms that are toxic that'll make you really sick. You'll get some really bad gastrointestinal issues for a few weeks or a month. You might have some liver or kidney damage. You definitely don't want that. So really, know your mushrooms, don't eat them, but you can touch any mushroom you want. Touching that mushroom is not going to cause any problems for you. Uh, you are going to be fine. The only thing I recommend is if you're handling a lot of mushrooms like I am, don't, you know, maybe wipe your hands before you go eat your sandwich. You just don't want to be eating. And if you had a bunch of mushrooms on your hands eating that because it's basically ingesting that becomes the problem. Now, for those of us uh, that go out with certain individuals and friends, uh, we do actually taste every mushroom, even poisonous mushrooms. You may not wanna do that, uh, completely fine. You have to make sure you spit out every little bit of that mushroom. Um, but you can actually taste every mushroom. You just can't ingest it. Um, I've been burned a couple of times with a super uh, spicy, hot, peppery mushroom that was painful for, you know, a good few hours. So I'm not that uh, brave. I'm not that much of a risk taker, but I know people who are and it's completely fine. But that's just a fun little story if you have an interest. When I'm working with dye mushrooms, I tend to dehydrate them in a special dehydrator that I have. If you start dehydrating dye mushrooms, do not dehydrate your fruit in it, do not dehydrate your edibles because inevitably bits and pieces fall out and you don't know what's in the end of ingesting certain things. Um, if you use a dehydrator, it's going to really uh, dehydrate them. So it kills any little bugs or moths or worms or anything that's uh, growing in there. And then I store them and use them down the road. Um, when it's mushroom season, I wanna spend as much time as I can in the forest. And I tend to work in my studio doing dyes and stuff um, in other seasons. So that's why I like to dry mine. However, there are times that I come back and I use them fresh absolutely use them fresh. If you've found an amazing, uh, you know, sweet spot of some rotten old mush, uh, lobsters, definitely cook them up the next day. You're going to get beautiful colors and you're not going to be processing a bunch of stinky rotten mushrooms because the lobster mushrooms, oh, they stink. Um, and my parents can vouch for that. I've, 
I've let some sit out in their garage, smelled like a latrine the next day. Um, so work with them fresh. You can also freeze your mushrooms. It's totally fine to freeze them. I don't freeze them because I don't have room in my freezer. Um, but you can work with that. And then you want to think about the mushrooms themselves. Like how many mushrooms do you have? So when you weigh your mushrooms, um, if they're dry, you know you're getting very concentrated amount of mushroom. You're not getting any of that additional water versus if you're working with them fresh, they're going to weigh a lot more, but 80, 90% of that's going to be water. So when you're thinking about, do I have enough mushrooms to dye this piece of fiber that I have, fabric or yarn? If you're working with them fresh, I kind of eyeball it. I say, okay, I've got a pile of mushrooms there. It's about this big. And I wad my fiber together and it's like yeah they're basically one to one i'm going to be fine i'm going to get some color but if i have this huge wad of yarn and a little pile of mushrooms i'm not going to get much and vice versa if i have this huge pile of mushrooms and only a little bit of yarn that's going to be incredibly intense so for those of us that are out doing this we like to make sure we're working uh with the right amount so we're not wasting uh, this lovely, beautiful uh, pigment and color that's there, the rainbow beneath our feet. So in the natural dye world, we think about the weight of the goods. How much does this little, you know, pot of mushrooms weigh and how much does my fiber weigh? If my fiber weighs 10 grams, then I'm going to want 10 grams of mushrooms. And it's what we call the one-to-one -one ratio. That's a super easy way to start. Um, but if you do find mushrooms, reference the Mushroom Color Atlas, because for lots of mushrooms, the dyer's polypore, you can use half the amount. For some of these types of quaternaries, you can use half the amount. So you can use less mushroom to your weight of fiber. Um, and for some of them, you want to use double, like the lobsters. To get some really rich colors, you want twice as much. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how I work with them. And there's a few things I'm particular about for those dyers out there. I like to grind my mushrooms in a coffee grinder. And again, this is not the coffee grinder I am using to grind my coffee that I would drink. It's just for mushrooms. Um, and I wear a mask when I do that to just avoid anything, any particulates. I mean, I was wearing masks in the studios, you know, well before COVID. In fact, it was a problem when COVID hit because I only had one more left and then I couldn't get any of my good masks. But um, that gives you a sense of how to start to work with the mushrooms. Um, for all natural dyeing, they tend to perform well on natural fibers. Um, and that's true for mushrooms, just like it is for other things, flowers and plants and so forth. And I'm working with wool, silk, and um, linen. And you want to clean your fabric. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, maybe you're gone to a Goodwill and you've reclaimed, you know, a beautiful white sweater or shirt or scarf or what have you. Definitely scour that. We use the word scouring, but it's basically washing. You just want to clean it. You want to get any remnants of the manufacturing process or any grime off of that fabric to keep it clean. So again, on the Mushroom Color Atlas, I walk you through the simple steps to do it. Uh, some people even quote unquote scour just using their washing machine. Um, so you can do that. And then there's something I touched on a little bit. Uh, it's called mordanting. And I was talking about how some of these historical mushrooms that were used all the way back to the 15th century had mordant properties in them. Um, and that's true. The dyer's polypore has tannins in it. So it can be used without any kind of mineral mordant and the color is going to be light fast and color fast. It, you know, it's a two for one. Um, there's very few plants that behave that way. There are some, but mushrooms are really unique in that way. And this mordant, it's a strange term. It comes from, uh, it's a French term that means to bite or to bind. And so when synthetic dyes were created, um, they took that idea of the binder and the dye and they combined it in the lab. So all the clothes that we have that are not naturally dyed have the, the binder in it affixed into the dye. But for natural dyes, we have to pre-treat our fabric and mordant them. And that's a process we take it through. 
And there's different types of mineral mordants that you can use, uh, different types of tannins, a whole variety of things. Um, and again, in the Mushroom Color Atlas, I walked through all the details, but it's, it's very simple. You get a mineral mordant and you use a certain percentage of it to your weight of fiber and you put it in a warm pot um, and you let it steep for an hour. Um, that is the basic rule of thumb that can get anyone started. But mordantine is an art in and of itself. Um, there's a lot of nuances to it. There's a lot of things that you learn. Um, and mordantine informs the color outcome. So I do a little more complex mordantine than that, and that is outlined as well. Um, so there's kind of the basic beginner and then the more advanced, um, because when you're working with cellulose fibers like linen or hemp, um, cotton, you wanna use a different mordantine technique than you would if you were working with protein fibers like wool and silk. So that just, uh, brief little thing. I'm happy to answer any questions about it. And then dyeing with the mushrooms. You know, I've talked about it a bit. I'm working with dried mushrooms. Most of the time I do work with fresh, but I'll grind them up. And I use large um, jars to do the tests with the mushroom color atlas because I'm using little three inch squares, these swatches of fabric that I showed you. So I don't need a big pot. I don't wanna waste a bunch of water. I just wanna use the small amount that I need. And so that's how I went about doing it um, in the Mushroom Color Atlas. It's kind of uh, a canning approach, like if you would were to can whatever, peaches or apples or tomatoes. Um, and then after I was done with the dye, if you've ever worked with natural dyes and especially with mushrooms, you notice there's still a lot of color in there. And us dyers like to do what we call exhaust baths. So we'll put some fiber in and we get this glorious color out and it's like, but there's more. So we put another set of fiber in and we were exhausting that bath and we're getting the same glorious color, but maybe not at the same saturation or vibrancy because there was less color. And then we'll exhaust it again. And we exhaust it down to where we get, leave no color behind. I like that, leave no color behind. But what I did is I said, hey, there's still a lot of color in this dye bath. And this dye bath is soluble. I basically heated up some water I've steeped the mushrooms in it like you would steep a cup of tea. Um, and I now want to take that soluble dye bath and I want it to become insoluble by turning it into a pigment. And this is a process called laking. Um, it's a simple process. And again, it's another uh, French term, laking, um, which comes from some work that the French were doing where they were trying to, they were working with the uh, lac, which is a, a natural dye, and they were trying to extract pigment and they were experimenting and this process was derived. And so they called it laking or lake to make a lake after lac. Um, but this is a process where I'm basically using those kind of mineral mordants. Um, I'm looking at the pH and I'm adding some things that are acidic and things that are alkaline and they're having this chemical reaction where the color that is in that dye bath is globbing on and building up these pigment molecules. So that's, again, I have more about laking on the site, but it's a great way to reuse your dye baths and you take them through a straining process and you get this pigment and you can then use that pigment to make any kind of paint you want. I've made watercolor paint as my example here, um, but you can you know, use soy in it as a binder and make soy paint. You can make casein, you could put you know, resin in it to make oil, you can use egg and make tempera paint. So it's truly a pigment that you can transform into anything. And then ultimately you can use that pigment to paint. And in this case, I did it on paper, but in my own work, I do it on fiber and fabric and canvases, and you can, you know, use different binders. So all uh, paint has a binder in it. It's the same concept as a mordant. You need that binder for that pigment to attach to the surface. Um, so you can play with different binders. I used gum Arabic to make my watercolor 
Um, but I can use gum tragacanth to make a thicker for uh, printing and painting on fabric. You know, it's a whole range. So that's how you can then get the paint from the mushrooms. Um, so as we think about the future of um, mushrooms and the fungi kingdom and that whole world, and we think about what is happening and we go back to Jonathan Riki's quote about kind of uh, channeling the creativity of mushrooms in new ways. I love to look at what some um, leading companies are doing like MycoWorks. Um, they are actually growing mycelium to make an alternative to leather. And it's just, you know, here that's used for leather, but you can use, uh, people are growing mycelium for building blocks, all kinds of things. It's just incredible. And then the myco remediation of, of using certain fungi to clean up oil spills and so forth. It's just incredibly powerful. But um, the other thing is there's lots of designers um, like Christine Boland who used the color palette from the Mushroom Color Atlas to inspire and inform her color palette for her fashion um, design and her work that she's doing. And then uh, this last fall, I hosted um, a group of color designers from Nike who are kind of charged with thinking about the, the future, the next 50 years of Nike, and here they are looking at colors derived from mushroom as a way to inform them and their work. So we went out foraging, and then we came back into the studio, and we were dying with those mushrooms. So to me, that's just really exciting. And, you know, we are uh, cultivating edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms, and wouldn't that be amazing someday if we could figure out how to cultivate dye mushrooms so they could start to... Um, play a role in the fiber revolution and the slow fiber uh, kind of defeating the fast fashion and the synthetic dyes would be amazing. So finally, I have to put in a little plug. Um, Miriam Rice, who I mentioned, who uh, led the kind of pioneer the way for more modern day use of mushroom dyes. She had some partners in Sweden, Carl and um, Erica Sandstrom and they, Sandstrom, sorry, I said that wrong. And they formed this organization called the International Fungi and Fiber uh, Symposium. And it has been held every couple of years since the 1980s. And it brings people from all over the world um, to basically, you know, do the research and the science and experiment and document and share and transfer knowledge and learn from each other. Um, not only how the mushrooms are behaving in terms of their color, but identification and, and making headway into identifying new um, species and varieties and so forth. I'm super excited because the Fungi and Fiber Symposium is gonna be hosted in Port Towns in Washington. So if any of you um, are interested in spending a week uh, with all of us, uh, enthusiastic, passionate fungi and fiber lovers, we would welcome you. Um, it hasn't been in the United States for about 16, maybe 18 years now. We were going to hold it in 2020, but we all know what happened, but it's going to be this fall. So if you've got the bug, you can go register and it's anyone, you know, you can be a novice and know very little to be a more experienced mushroom dyer, but we're going to have a wonderful time up there together. So Thank you all for joining. I really, really appreciate it. This has been great. And thank you, Mount St. Helens Institute for the invitation. So questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. Let's well, first see. of all, thank you. That was really amazing and super interesting. Um, we do have quite a few questions. So um, somebody asked, will the colors fade when used for paint and how long do the colors last? So that's a good question. So light fastness and color fastness is something that all of us dyers consider with natural dyes and needs to be considered with mushroom dyes as well. Um, there are some mushrooms where the colors are going to fade over time, whether they're a dye or a pigment. And then there are a lot of mushrooms that are incredibly color fast. Um, so often, there's no real easy answer to that, except the nuance of understanding the specific mushrooms. And my goal 
is to do um, these light fast tests and publish that into the Mushroom Color Atlas so people can see what happens to the color over time. Um, for example, the Ophelotus olivescence, which is a lovely, it's the Western jack-o'-lantern mushroom. It's on my bucket list to find someday. It grows in um, Northern California. It's a beautiful dye mushroom and it makes incredible purples. Now those purples do shift over time, but the color doesn't fade and go away. It just shifts to a different um, shade. So that can happen where they can shift in their color range, but not necessarily fade. Um, all the pigments that I've shown here uh, are, they've all got the various chemical properties and then using binders that are light fast and color fast, but there are some that are trickier, but like the Dyer's polypore because it has the tannins in it or some of those other polypores that have alum and so forth, they are definitely color fast and light fast, so. Okay. Um, another question, are there any fungal dyes which are toxic when rinsed, meaning should not be flushed down the sink? <laughs> no, that, it's fine. What you would need to be considered to, is the um, pH of your dye bath. So if you're on a septic system like I am, I don't want to necessarily flush a highly alkaline uh, dye bath down my sink because that's going to impact my septic system. So I'm going to basically dilute that. Um, but what you do want to be cognizant of is that if you are throwing out your dye bath and it has some mushrooms in it, and it has some mushrooms, say, uh, like the dyer's polypore that is uh, a butt rot or a white rot, you might not want to uh, get rid of those on your property or in your sink, you might want to just throw those out in the trash or I, I wouldn't compost it either. But that's more of what I think about is with certain mushrooms, I'm like, you know, I don't really want to just throw that out onto the property. And other ones, I'm like, I'm throwing as much as I can because I do anything for these, <laughs> you know, to get that fungi established and have yeah. a fruit. So awesome. Uh so you mentioned a little bit about lobsters and I yeah. have found lobsters, they're tasty and, yeah. you know, the older they get, they definitely do get very stinky. And so I guess my question is like, does that stinkiness ever like translate into the dyes or <laughs> is it? Um, no, it doesn't, but it does translate when you're cooking them up. So you want to cook. Um, I do. I would say 98% of my dying outdoors. Mm -hmm. You can do it indoors as long as you have a well-ventilated space because they will stink. They're basically fermenting and rotting mm -hmm. and they're called lobsters because they taste like lobsters, but they also smell like lobsters. Um, so it is uh, a dye bath. I love working with it, but I keep it outdoors and I don't actually store it. I do have friends that keep fermented lobster in pots, you know, in buckets, and they open them up six months later and, you know, practically lose their lunch from the smell. I can't stand that. But yeah, no. And then, and the fibers and stuff will not smell from it. It all rinses out, but it does smell when you cook them. Okay. Um, final question. You know, you talked a little bit about like, I think putting iron in to bring out another color. And then there was mm -hmm. another mushroom where like the caps and the stems for yep. different variations. What other factors go into determining what colors you can get from a particular mushroom? Yeah. So the mushroom itself, based on what chemical compounds it has for the color, will help decide that. The other thing is looking at the pH of a dye bath. So when you think about pH and you think about, you know, whatever, six and a half, seven is neutral. Some mushrooms like an acidic dye bath. And so that's making, pushing them to more four or five. And you might be using citric acid or vinegar to make it more acidic. Um, other mushrooms like to be alkaline and they like to be up in the nines and tens. And you could use soda um, wash. Uh, historically, mushroom dyers used ammonia 
Um, I don't use a lot of ammonia because I don't like it to cook um, Mm. because it can be a little upsetting. But um, those, so the pH of your dye bath is going to inform the colors and then the mordant itself will inform the colors and specifically the mordant with the fiber type. So that's something that with the Mushroom Color Atlas, by putting this array of fiber, you know, wool, silk, and linen, and different mordants, you get a sense of how it might respond um, with the fiber that you have and the mordant that you're using. You can push it to achieve those colors. So it's really kind of those three, four main factors um, that are defining it. But the mushroom itself does help define it. Like you mentioned with the cortinarius, the neosanguinus, the red accumulates in the cap and the orange accumulates in the stem. So right there, it's telling you, I can do two different things for you if you want to take the painful time of separating me. (laughs) Cool. Well, um, I really appreciate you taking time to spend with us and share your knowledge. And I hope that we can have you back real soon because this was just amazing so thank you julie oh thank you and thanks everyone for joining i appreciate it and thanks for the good questions have a good night everyone all right good night good night <laughs>